Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, from verse 19 to 29. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. As I mentioned last week, the remainder of John chapter 5 follows directly after Jesus healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. You remember that the Pharisees demanded to know from this healed man just who it was, who commanded him to carry his bed on the Sabbath. The miracle itself was completely irrelevant to them. And for the remainder of chapter 5, which we will cover today and next Sunday, Jesus answers his critics with this lengthy discourse. As a result of the miracle and the dispute which followed it, Jesus makes claims, which we'll be looking at today, and then next week we'll look at the proofs that he gives of his claims and how he challenges his opponents. And here we begin to see the reason for Jesus confronting the Jewish leaders for their religious hypocrisy. He now declared beyond any doubt just who he was. And in John chapter 5, we find Jesus' personal statement of his deity as he makes a series of bold claims in regards to his relationship to the Father. And it is these claims which then lead, on, lead directly to this ongoing persecution by the Pharisees. In their eyes, Jesus' claims were nothing short of blasphemy, which resulted in finally in being put to death. He claimed to be equal with God in his person, to be equal with God in his works, to be equal with God in his power and his sovereignty, equal with God in his judgment, and equal with God in the honor that he was to receive. Things were now coming to a head, and a key verse in understanding just what Jesus is saying is in verse 18, where we ended last Sunday. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This is in fact a key verse in the entire Gospel of John. Because many of the confrontations that Jesus was to have with the Pharisees have their root or their source in John 5 verse 18. Because if Sabbath breaking was a serious offense, then claiming to be equal with God was nothing short of rank heresy. And the deity of, of Christ is a central theme of the Gospel of John. And in chapter 10 verse 30, Jesus quite simply says, I and the Father are one. And by claiming that he and the Father are one, Jesus was establishing his authority. And the Pharisees could just not believe what they were hearing. And it's no wonder that they've hounded him all the way to the cross. You've probably heard before that some argue that Jesus never claimed deity and he was greatly misunderstood. But that's simply not true. He claimed it consistently. There's an American theologian by the name of Robert Leitner who died about four years ago. And in one of his books he wrote this. Christ has existed eternally as the Son of God. Though no specific verse states this truth precisely that way, the evidence pointing in that direction is overwhelming. Whenever the title is used of him, it speaks of his divine essence. His fierce critics, the Jewish religious leaders, did not fail to make the connection between his repeated claims that God is his father 
and his claim for deity that he is equal with God the Father. What he's basically saying here is that the Jewish authorities knew exactly what Jesus was claiming, and ultimately they killed him for it. And in Jesus' opening statement to the Pharisees in verse 19, he begins by saying, truly, truly. And he does this three times in the 11 verses we're looking at today. Other English translations quote Jesus as saying, most assuredly, I tell you the truth, very truly. And in the old King James Version, you'll be familiar with, verily, verily, as he, as he makes these statements. This was an emphatic way of saying, listen very carefully to what I'm about to say to you, because I'm telling you the truth. And as the, 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 the Pharisees became increasingly hostile to him, Jesus became even more fearless, more forceful, and more emphatic. And in John 5, he connected his healing on the Sabbath directly to the Father. Because he clearly intended the Jews to, to think of him and to accept him as someone who was equal with God. Because it would be absurd for a mere man to claim to do the things which God himself does. Jesus claimed to see what the Father was doing. And in order to make such a claim, he must have continual access to the Father and complete knowledge and understanding of God and his ways. And this is something no normal human being has. We have the occasional glimpse of God and his mysterious ways. But what we do know about God is infinitely less than what we don't know. The Jews accused Jesus of making himself equal with God. But instead of denying the charge, Jesus makes these bold statements as proof of the fact that he and the Father are one. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, so the Son does the same. Now, raising the dead is only possible for God. Yet Jesus claims this power for himself. He says in verse 20, The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. So not only does Jesus see the works of God, but he had the power to perform them as well. And he goes on to say that through him, God would show even greater things than these, so that the people would marvel. Now they had already marveled. They had just seen him, they'd seen him performing, performing miracles. They would just seen him heal a man who had been crippled for 38 years. But now Jesus says they'll see even greater things. The first of those greater things will be raising the dead. And the second would be his work of judging mankind. As he says in verses 21 and 22. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. What did Jesus mean by saying that he gives life? just as the Father does. Now this clearly goes much deeper than the raising of the physically dead to life, as, as in the case of Lazarus. As God raises people from death to life, so Jesus gives condemned sinners life, eternal life. And he says in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Turning water into wine or healing a, a, a lame man was nothing. Even calling Lazarus out of his tomb pales into near insignificance in comparison to the greatest miracle of all. The staggering truth that the enemies of God, rebellious sinners like you and me, are given the gift of eternal life as the condemnation of our sins is completely removed from us and placed on Christ instead. And going back to verse 22, Jesus says something else which would have been scandalous to the Jews. The Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son. Now, being steeped in what we know as the Old Testament today, the Jewish leaders knew that God alone had the right to judge humanity. So by claiming that the Father had committed all judgment to him, again, Jesus was claiming equality with God. And in verse 23, we see the reason that God has given the Son that authority to raise the dead and to judge the world. The reason is that all should honor Christ as they honor the Father. 
Now, this is such a crucial point for us to grasp as Christians, because this is one of the points where the Christian faith stands apart from all other faith systems. Throughout the Bible, we are taught that God alone is to be worshipped. The very first of the Ten Commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. And now, in John 5, verse 23, Jesus says we are to honor him as we honor the Father. And the only conclusion we can come to from this verse is that Jesus Christ is God. Now, many people claim to worship God, but they deny that Jesus Christ is God. We've heard it all before. He was a great man, a wonderful prophet. He was a teacher who was full of wisdom. But they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Don't fall for the lie that we all worship the same God, but we just do it differently. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. And his statement, his claim that he makes in verse 23, puts him on, with an, on absolute equality with God. And this means that we are to honor him the same way that we honor God himself. But you cannot do that if you deny that Jesus is God which every religion, with the exception of Christianity, does. Anyone who does not honor Christ does not honor God. The great irony here is that it was Jesus who was accused of blasphemy and who was executed for it. But it was the Jews who rejected him as the Messiah who were really guilty of the sin of blasphemy. And so it is with everybody else who will not, in the words of Philippians 2, Bow the knee at the name of Jesus and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when Jesus says in verse 24 that those who hear his word and believe in him have passed from death to life, he is building on the truth which he claimed in verse 21. He gives life to whomever he, des he desires. Eternal life is given to the believer at the moment of conversion. Our Justification is given completely and fully at the moment of belief in Jesus Christ. This is how we are able to live the rest of our lives, our earthly lives, with this absolute assurance that our salvation is signed, sealed, and as good as delivered, as, 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 as if it has already been received. He says he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. Now compare that with what Jesus said to Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Condemned already. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2, we are by our very nature children of wrath, and we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But now, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are raised to new life with him. And that happens here and now. He not only raised Lazarus to life, but if you are a Christian, you have been raised to spiritual life because you've been born from above. When Jesus says that believers have passed from death to life in verse 24, it's in the perfect present tense. It's not only a promise of the future, but it's a present reality. Because those who put their faith in the atoning work of Jesus on the cross have passed from spiritual death into spiritual life. Before our conversion, we were in our trespasses and sins. We were dead as far as love for God or fellowship with him was concerned. But at the moment of being saved by faith in Jesus, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and we now possess eternal life. This also means that the opposite is also true. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, both life and condemnation are present realities and they have eternal consequences. The truth is that there are only two types of people in the world. Despite all the diversity we see around us, there are only two types. The spiritually alive and the spiritually dead. And so for the Christian... Salvation is not only an object of hope for the future, as wonderful as that is, but it's a present reality because we are no longer condemned. Romans 8 verse 1 tells us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you are saved by Christ, you are not condemned now and you will never be condemned in the future. 
You are free from judgment because Jesus paid the penalty of your sins at Calvary. God will not demand payment for that penalty again because Jesus has paid it on your behalf. Just think of the logic here. He has finished the work of salvation and you, nothing can be added to something which is finished. If you put your faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you will never be punished for your sins. Now that being said, until such time as we enter into glory, we continue to live in a fallen and a broken world where the fallout and the consequences of our sins remain. We do suffer. There's no, there's no arguing that. Sometimes it's your fault. Other times it's the fault of someone else's sins. But the eternal condemnation of your sins has been dealt with. As I said last week, if you rob a bank, you will go to jail. But the eternal condemnation has been taken by Christ. We need to remember that our justification deals with the penalty of our sins. <coughs> Sanctification deals with the power of sin in our lives. But one day, as a Christian, you will experience glorification. And then you will be free not only from the penalty and the, presence of, uh, the power of sin, but the presence of sin itself. And that will continue for all of eternity. Now Jesus says, whoever hears my word, to hear the word of Jesus means not only to listen to it, but also to receive it, to believe it, and to obey it. Many people hear the gospel preached, but they do nothing about it. And Jesus is saying here that we have to accept his teaching as true and believe that he is indeed the savior of the world. He continues, and believes him who sent me. This is a matter of believing God, but... Does this mean the sinners are saved simply by believing God? Well, many people profess to believe in God, but they've never been converted. What Jesus is teaching here is that we are to believe in God who sent Jesus into the world. What are we to believe? That God sent Christ to be our Savior. You are only saved when you believe what God says about Jesus. Namely, that he is the only Savior. And that our sins can only be forgiven through his work at Calvary. The Pharisees believed in God. But they did not believe that he sent Jesus as the only means of them being saved. Which meant that they remained dead in their sins. They were already condemned because they rejected Jesus. And in verse 25, Jesus again emphasizes this, this present reality of salvation for those who believe in him. When he says, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. An hour is coming and is now here. This refers to what is sometimes called this now but not yet principle of salvation. Those who are born again are already spiritually resurrected while a future physical resurrection is still to come. And Jesus says something very important in verses 25 to 27. Look at how he refers to himself here. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. As the son of God, he is equal with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And as the son of God, he gives life. But he is also the son of man. He came into this world as a man. He lived among men and women. And he died on the cross as a substitute for men and women. He was rejected and crucified when he came as a man. And when he comes again, he will come to judge his enemies and to be honored in this very same world where he was once so cruelly treated. Because he is both God and man, he is perfectly qualified to be the judge. Jesus often referred to himself as the son of man. And one of the reasons he did this was to connect himself directly with the vision that was given to the prophet Daniel. As the Son of Man, Jesus was perfectly and fully human, but he remained fully God at the same time. This is from Daniel chapter 7, a vision that he was given. 
I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that will not be destroyed. The significance of Jesus referring to himself as, as the Son of Man would not have been lost on the Pharisees. Because they would have been very familiar with the writings of Daniel. Again, Jesus makes it very clear that he was equal to God. And then in verses 28 and 29, he says, An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There are two points we're going to look at here. Firstly, those who have done good and those who have done evil. It is so important that we understand what Jesus is talking about here. He is not teaching justification by works. The only good that we can do when it comes to the issue of salvation is believing in Jesus Christ as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. When we believe in him, we receive a new nature, which then produces good works. But those good works, as important as they are, are the fruit, not the root of our salvation. On the other hand, the evil done which Jesus talks about is rejection of himself as the only means of being saved. Remember from chapter 3 again. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's the evil deed. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Our, our deeds, whether good or bad, are evidence or fruit of our nature as being saved or unsaved. But our deeds never determine our salvation. Now, there's both a warning and some comfort in this reality. Firstly, it means that you cannot earn your way into heaven, regardless of how genuine or how generous or how sacrificial your good works are. They will not earn your salvation. And secondly, we, we can take comfort in this truth too, because as a Christian, you will continue to sin. You don't need me to remind you of that. But you will not be condemned for those evil deeds after being saved. The condemnation happened at Calvary. Verse 29 does not teach that people who have done good will be saved because of their good deeds. And those who have done evil will be condemned because of their evil deeds. Christians are not saved by doing good, but we do good because we are saved. Good works are not the cause of salvation. They are the effect of salvation. And in the context of verse 29 in John 5, those who have done evil are those who have never put their faith and their trust in Christ, and consequently whose lives have been evil in the sight of God. And that leads to our final point for today. In verses 28 and 29, Jesus speaks about two resurrections, the resurrection to life and the resurrection to judgment. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now the same John who wrote this gospel was also the author of the book of Revelation. And there is a clear link between Jesus' words here in John 5 and a vision which John was given in Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. John 5, 28 and 29, and Revelation 20, 12 through 15, and many other passages in Scripture stand directly opposed to the false doctrine of, of annihilationism. 
this idea that believers, when they die, go to heaven. But those who reject Jesus will actually not be punished, but instead they'll be annihilated. They will, they will simply cease to exist, almost as if they'd never lived at all. And this is one of the many heresies that the Jehovah's Witness cult teaches. But this is not what Scripture teaches. You might have seen on our Facebook page a couple of weeks ago, I took a screenshot of a tweet by the theologian Stephen Lawson. He says, Jesus is calling, salvation is offered, time is fleeting, death is approaching, eternity is looming, judgment is coming, heaven is beckoning, hell is waiting. Hell is a very real place and a multitude of people are going there for all of eternity. Don't be one of them. And in the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the glory of the gospel of Christ. We thank you, Jesus, that you are God. We thank you that you came into this world not just to show us the way of truth, but to reveal yourself as the truth, to reveal yourself as the only way to forgiveness and to the Father. We thank you for the miracle of salvation. We marvel at the works that you have done that are recorded in Scripture. That you've healed the sick and the lame, you've given sight to the blind, you've even raised the dead. But the greatest miracle of all is that you've given us the gift and the miracle of spiritual life. And for that we give you our thanks. And we pray that you continue to use us, your church, to take this message of hope, this message of glory, into this dark and desperately dying world. Father, we give you all praise, honor, and glory. And we bless you for the hope that we have in Christ and in Christ alone. Amen.